All right, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful, isn't it? Yes, it is. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit on the joints and the marrow is a critic of the thoughts and tense of the heart. All scripture is God breathed and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're going to take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word through the, through the technique of rebound and operation cry. So with your heads bowed and eyes closed, you, uh, you actually take those uh, two passages, 1 John 1, 9 and Romans 6, 6, 11 and 13. Apply them to your life and we'll be ready to study the word of God. Heads bowed and eyes closed, you make your own way with the Lord. Father, it's another day. You've made it, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Well, let me put it this way. Those who have a desire to uh, rejoice in this day will do so. Others without doctrine will not be able to do so. Why? Because they don't really understand what life is all about. So when we take a look at uh, our passage in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 today, and verses 1 through 6 leading up to that, Father, I pray that our minds will be open to receive the truth as the Spirit of God teaches us the meaning of the word. And I pray that we'll take that same word then and take it into life so that we might be the kind of light that we need to be out there in the public square. Father, the world needs us, Christians, not just Jim Brattel, but the world needs, the world needs Christians. The world needs the gospel. The believers need the word of God. So. We rejoice today, Father, in the fact that you've made another provision for us for Bible class. Teach us in Christ's name. Amen. Let me make an announcement or two before, before we begin. I see that this morning I had a chance to just chat with, uh, uh, with, Don, uh, with Dennis Ball. And uh, Dennis is running for sheriff, uh, county sheriff in Perry County. And uh, a mutual friend... Calvin Grogan is actually running for uh, the sheriff's position in Pulaski County. And uh, I, I want, to, want you to consider two things. Uh, praying for, um, for both Dennis and Calvin as uh, God will lead them in, into the right areas where the people come to understanding who these men are. These are both retired police officers from the Little Rock Police Department. These are men who know and understand the Constitution they understand the Bible, and I believe that they would be the men that, uh, that God would want for these two positions. Uh, I know that uh, as, as we uh, run for, run for uh, public office, uh, there are times when finances are, are needed. Dennis has not asked me for a cent. Uh, matter of fact, Dennis and Calvin are the only two people running for office today that haven't asked me for money. But if you if you so led, uh, so led to contribute to their campaign, it might uh, might provide a sign somewhere, might provide gasoline to get to another place. But listen, the county sheriff is probably one of the most important positions in our life as far as the civil world is concerned. So just give that some concern and please put them both on your prayer list and remember them in prayer as you go about your day. Now, Philippians 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 7 is our subject this morning. And uh, I wanted to mention also that one of the things that, that I have heard recently is that uh, David Barton uh, is, uh, is a man who actually surveys uh, Christians and surveys the Christian world. And in a conversation that I was having with someone that's uh, nationally known a couple of days ago, uh, one of the comments that was made that in, in the church, in the body of Christ, uh, across this country, whether it's, a, whether it's a, a local assembly or whether it's just the assembly at large of all uh, born-again Christians, one of the things that is the greatest, well, how about this, the greatest problem, not one of, the greatest problem among Christians today in the United States has, has been determined to be fear. It's the fear factor. 
And uh, this is one of the things that I we know that God has not given us the spirit of fear. But I was talking to my wife this morning at the breakfast table, and one of the thoughts that came to mind in the last few days uh, that I've just sort of mulled this over my own mind is the term life. There's physical life and there's spiritual life. And you can have uh, you can have uh, spiritual life without physical life after death. Uh, you you uh, you can have you can have life and not have spiritual life. So when people talk about life, uh, they really are basically talking about physical life and the mess that they're in and the the discomfort that they're in because of the crises of life. But when you are when you as a born again Christian understand the Word of God. The truth of the matter is, is as you understand the word of God as it's to be understood, you know that God is in control of every circumstance of life. So when you're faced with a circumstance you don't like, you you don't like the feelings that are attached to it. You don't like the discomfort that's attached to it. You have to realize, and until you are willing to realize that God is in control of that circumstance, and he's doing one of two things in your life. He's either trying to get your attention that something's not working right, or he's actually allowed this thing to happen in your life. He's provided that in order to encourage you to go to the grace provisions and find um, find what you need to hold you in that situation. But until we're uh, until we're willing to understand that every circumstance of life belongs to God, He's allowed it, He's ordained it, He's He's a, He's just permitted this to happen. And the question then is. When you look at that situation, you ask yourself, what is this, what is this saying to me? What, what should I learn from this? Well, that being the case, when we go back to, when we go back to uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, let's go back and pick up our notes right there. And we'll, we'll begin to look at that passage beginning in verse, let me see here now, there it is. Beginning in verse one, and I, I, I like I like this introduction up to verse seven. And we've taken listen, we've taken a, a, a really a lesson at a time on each of these verses, and some of them have taken more than more than one session. But going back to verse one, we have to take a look at verse twenty nine and thirty in the previous chapter because what Paul is is acknowledging is that not only is he being persecuted, not only is he under pressure at this point in time by being in, in prison in Rome and simply because of who and what he is as a born again Christian. He finds that now at the same time, the Philippians are undergoing that same kind of persecution. They're not in jail at that point in time, but they're suffering persecution because of who and what they are. Now, when you're living the life that God wants you to live, and I'm talking about the spiritual life, not the physical life, you have physical life and you should have spiritual life. And actually when you're born again, that's where it all begins. But if you're a carnal believer, you're not living the kind of life that God wants you to live. And I want us to get to the point of realizing when the circumstances of life come to us and we, we see more pressure or we just see a good, a good situation where the pressure seems to be minimized. Well, if you continue to live the Christian way of life, you're going to find more of these times when, goodness, it's just like the bottom dropped out of everything. But real life, the spiritual life, is going to enable you to be happy in every circumstance of life. That's that's uh, really uh, plus age. That's the the type the type of uh, happiness that God possesses. He's granted us that same kind of capacity. So realizing that they're under pressure for their uh, for their faith, we begin in verse one. Then just very quickly through the first six verses. Therefore, he says, if there is any encouragement, why would they need any encouragement? It's because they're under pressure in life. So uh, knowing that, he says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, and that's a first-class condition, meaning and there is, if any consolation of love, and there is, if any, and that word consolation means comfort, comfort in the love of God. You know he loves you, no matter what the circumstance. Then he says, if any fellowship of the Spirit, that's living in the sphere of the Spirit. That is actually a first-class condition again, if it is true. Then the last one, he says, if any affection and compassion. So he says encouragement, comfort, fellowship of the Spirit, affection and compassion. These belong to us. They are a guarantee if we're living in the sphere of the Spirit. Then he says, make my joy complete. You're, you're, you're under pressure. 
in verse one, here's, here's some solutions for you. And now as a result of that, let's move on. Make my joy complete. Paul is, Paul is actually, he's happy because of the growth of these people. But if they continue to grow, they're headed for no man's land. And that's simply our term for because of your Christian way of life, because you are being salt and light, light in the public square. This means that as you become visible as a born again Christian, their people are seeing the, 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 the lifestyle that you're living, that the persecution is going to ramp up. And this is the area of your Christian life where you've learned to stand, uh, really, you, you've come to know who you are in Christ. You have enough doctrine that you know who you are in Christ, which means you've taken your entire past, you've placed that in the hands of God, you're already forgiven of every sin you've ever committed, you're going to be forgiven of the sins you've committed, the ones you're in the past, the ones you're committing, and the ones that you're going to commit in the future. Hopefully, as we grow, there will be less of that in the future, that is sinning. So he says, make my joy complete. And the way they're going to make his joy complete is if, in fact, they go beyond spiritual self-esteem, where they now know who they are in Christ, enter into, into uh, spiritual no man's land in spiritual autonomy, and begin to pass the various tests that are going to come to you there. You've had these same kind of tests when you're a babe in Christ. You actually had these tests before you became saved. Like people test, there have been people that are bugging you all your life, okay? But the truth of the matter is, without doctrine, you may not know how to handle that situation. You may not know how to love um, love people in that kind of a situation. You may not be able to, to get away from being hateful, resentful, that kind of thing. No, you need to grow to the place where you're able to love people no matter what the circumstance of life. God loves you and me in that circumstance. Why can't we learn to live people? And that is people who are doing us dirty, doing bad things to us, knowing that God is in control of those circumstances. So Paul says, look, make my joy complete. Let's move on from here. He said, I want you to come, come on. I want you to catch up with where I am eventually reaching maximum spiritual maturity. So he says, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. That means think like I think. And, and basically, as a pastor, I, I realize that it's my responsibility to think the way that Paul thought, think the way that Jesus thought, think the way that God wants me to think, and then I would pray that you would be of the same mind. Now, I know as a, re, as a result of recent phone calls and recent conversations with, with people that there are those who are born-again Christians, but they're certainly not of the same mind that I am. Well, I believe that I know, I, I believe I know what I'm talking about, and I know this, that my mind is open, so if I found that there was something that I wasn't teaching correctly, or it wasn't, it wasn't as complete as what it should be, listen, I have no problem with changing my mind, I have no, cha no problem with ramping up with the uh, with the word of God and say, look, it was not, com I was not right about this. I was, uh, I was not complete about this and I'll move on with that. And I would like for, for you who are out there that are functioning under my ministry to make my joy complete for the same reason, being of the same mind, maintaining the same love. There's your agape love, the same love. Paul didn't get all, uh, he didn't get all upset and start bashing people because he was in jail. He didn't start uh, bashing people because they weren't supporting him. No, Paul Paul understood what life was all about. He knew that he was in an angelic conflict. He knew that he was fighting against the devil and the devil's the devil's army, uh, fighting sin and and good and 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 evil. But Paul had reached the point where he was able to handle these things. So maintaining the same love, united in spirit, united in intent and intent on one purpose, reaching the goal. Um, making sure that we're loving Jesus Christ, we're, we're functioning in the plan of God. Then he says in verse three, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. There's, there's that self-centered life. It's all about me. He said, but conjunction of contrast, instead of being selfish and full of empty conceit, how about this? But with humility, that's an attitude of surrender, surrender to God, but with humility, consider one another more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Keep on thinking, and that's a strong command. He says, keep on thinking this doctrine. Uh, actually, when he said, keep on thinking this, 
Well, you have to understand that what this is, is doctrine. So keep on thinking this doctrine. Keep on thinking this biblical truth within you. See, if it's within you, you can think about it. If you don't have it within you, this is why metabolization of doctrine is so important to each one of us. You can't think about something you don't possess. But as you metabolize the word of God, you have it in your frame of reference. It's in your memory, memory center as vocabulary, categories of doctrine, and a conscience. So you keep on thinking this within you, which also was resident in Christ Jesus. Jesus was, Jesus was functioning on the word of God. Then in verse 6, he said, speaking of Jesus, who, meaning Christ, has all as he already existed in the form of God. Now, what when we get to verse six, what we're going to see is Paul is is giving us some information that's going to describe Jesus Christ in his pre-incarnate self. So he says, who who as he already existed in the form of God, already, okay, that means in the past, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. In other words, when he looked at himself and he says, you know, I may, I may not be as good as this, this God out here, uh, but uh, I want to be like that. So uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to reach out and grasp all that, uh, that equality, that equality stuff and make me as good as he is. No, he said he all, as he already existed in the form of God, he did not consider equality with God something that had to be grasped. He was already there. Now, let's talk about this. These first first uh, six verses, and focus on verse six. Verse six and point one. Verse six answers the question, what is Paul trying to tell us here? Well, when you take verse six and then take a look at verse seven, you begin to understand, hey, there's Paul's telling us something about this person whose name is Christ. So in verse six, the one that we just read, Jesus, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. So verse 6 answers the question, what was the nature of Christ like before his incarnation? Now, what we need to realize here is that sometimes when we're, when we're talking about the Bible and uh, you're talking with somebody else or I'm talking with you, you've been with me for 30 years, you've been with me for uh, 10 years, you've been with me for five weeks, uh, two days or whatever. Sometimes when we use a word, the pastor uses a word, you say, what in the world is he talking about? When we talk about the incarnation, while you may understand that, somebody else may understand that big term, incarnation. And that means the time when he became, when he became humanity. So we're looking at him prior to the time he became humanity in verse 6. And so when he says here, Jesus, as he already existed, we're talking about in his pre-incarnate uh, self, in his, the essence of him at that point in time. So he said he didn't consider it equality, consider equality with God, something that had to be grasped. He was already equal with, uh, with the other two persons of the Godhead. Now, when we get to verse 7, verse 7 is going to answer the question, what was the nature of Christ after his incarnation? So in verse 6, we should learn something about what he was like before he became a human being. And in verse 7, we're going to begin to look at things as he was after his, his virgin birth, after his incarnation, incarnation when he became a human being. Now, in a little diagram here, in verse 6, and I've got, a, I've got a timeline, and I've got that barrier right there in the middle, and to the left of that barrier, that perpendicular line there, was before he became uh, before he became a human being. Now, that's going to go all the way back to uh, eternity past before anything else was, before anything else was, whether it was, uh, where there was no universe, there were no angels, there were no human beings, there was no planet Earth, there was no, there was no foliage, there were no blueberries, whatever, okay? This is before all that happened. But there came a point in time when that person in eternity past, the second person of the Godhead actually became a human being, and that was at the time of his virgin birth. So what we're looking here at is a timeline before his, before his virgin birth, verse 6, and then in verse 7, we're going to see him after his virgin birth. Now, I want to, I, I want to ask a couple of questions here, and that is when we're looking at Christ before his incarnation— and after his incarnation, can you actually explain the nature of Christ before his virgin birth? Can you explain it? 
to, if you were talking to somebody on the street, somebody that came to you and wanted to know more about this Jesus, wanted to know more about this Christianity, what is this Christian life all about? Well, obviously, you can't become a born-again Christian if you don't know who Jesus is. And uh, with all of the, the foolishness that's in the world today, oh, Jesus is just a human being. Oh, he was just another Jew. He was, a, he was a nice guy. He did a lot of wonderful things, but eh, he's not God. Well, can you explain the nature of Christ before his incarnation? And my question is, if not, why not? Now, I rather imagine most of you, if not all of you, can do that because you have understood the word of God, you've, you've been taught the word of God. And so when you're talking about Jesus in his pre-incarnate state, if you're talking about Jesus before his, his virgin birth, meaning that if you're talking about him back in the Old Testament, he, that's before his virgin birth. Well, what was he like at that point in time? What was his essence? What was his nature? Well, we have to understand that because there's going to come a time when there was a transformation. There was a change in that essence. So now then the second question I have is this. Can you explain the nature of Christ after his incarnation? So look at the timeline I got there. Verse 6 on the left, verse 7 on the right, verse 6 before his incarnation. Do you know what he was like then? Do you know what he was like after his incarnation? Do you understand what kind of a change took place? At that point in time, well, let's do this. Let's start here now. This is where we actually pick up our Bible study uh, this morning, and we're going to uh, we're going to pick up with verse uh, with verse seven. Okay. Now, verse seven says this. But he emptied himself. Let's go back and look at verse six. Who who is already as he already existed in the form of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. And then in verse 7, because he was already like God, what happened? But he emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born, how? He was born in the likeness of men. I wonder what all that means. Now let's take a look at it and see. Breaking that down, a word at a time, a phrase at a time. Now what happened is this. He said, but, well, here he is. In verse 6, he's exactly like God the Father. He has all of the essence, the, the exact nature of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And that is in his pre-incarnate state. But there came a point in time when that changed, and it says, but, and that's, a, that's going to establish a contrast between deity of Christ in verse 6 and his pre-incarnate life, and the humanity of Christ in verse 7. That word but says, look, we have a contrast here. What he was before his virgin birth is one thing. What he is after his virgin birth is something different. But can you explain these two things? Can you explain it to somebody if they wanted to know? Do you know yourself? Could you, could you think it through on your own and be comfortable with what you know about Jesus in eternity past, before he became a human being, and what he is like after his virgin birth. There's a contrast between verse 6 and 7. Now, let's talk about that, that word, but again. You see, the contrast was this, his nature before his incarnation and his nature after the incarnation. Now, what did he do? And I want to do something here that I, I don't think I've ever done before. As a matter of fact, I'm almost sure I haven't. But what I would like to do here is to split this screen, because when you're doing when you're listing one verse at a time, what I'd like to do is be able to take a look at the verse, continue to look at it up above here, so you see the whole verse, and then be able to explain one word or one verse at a time. And so that by the time you get to the middle of verse, and you you you. Uh, you make a comment about a word that's in the middle of a verse and say, wait a minute, but where does that fit into the rest of the verse? And that's why I split the screen here so we can go back and see the whole verse wherever we happen to be talking. So he says, but we know we've got a contrast before between his pre-incarnate life and his uh, his post-incarnate uh, incarnate life. Post-incarnate post life. Now, he says, but emptied. And the word emptied here is the word kano'o. And uh, actually, what I did uh, last week, I knew this was coming up. This verse 7 has about five different doctrines related 
to our understanding of this verse. And as I was uh, thinking about this passage as I was putting it together, I go, I go all the way back to 19, 1973 when Dr. W. O. Vaught um, said to me, here's what you need to do. He said, I see, I see that you're dissatisfied. I see that you're, you're struggling with something. Here is the answer to your life. So what he did is he pointed me to doctrine. And I followed, I followed his example. I followed his, his instructions. I did that. And when I, by that time, I was, I was in a denominational setting, had been in, in that setting for a year. It was my second church pastorate. And I was in that for about a year. And as I began to study the word of God, I said, goodness gracious, this is what I've been looking for, for my entire pastorate. I go back to 1963, and I actually was asked to preach a, a service in a particular setting. And when I did, I, I actually exegeted a passage. I exposited that passage and was very satisfied with what I had done. And when I got done in a private conversation, the pastor came to me and said, look, he said, I'm a little disappointed. He said, you didn't preach. He said, all you did was teach the Bible. And I was thinking to myself, wait, hold on just a second. So when I got to my second, uh, second pastorate in here in Arkansas, I was teaching the word of God. And because I had come to understand that doctrine was so important to my life, I began to teach uh, specific doctrines. I had all these doctrines now, uh, about 150 of them or so. I, I'm not sure how many there were all together at that time, but I started to teach doctrine. Well, you had this doctrine had 24 pages in it. The next one had seven pages in it. The next one had 53 pages in it. So you're teaching this, this doctrine to the people in the pew, and it wasn't very long until the people in the pew began to get concerned about the fact that I wasn't evangelizing the saved in the congregation. So we found that uh, this is where I began to get some, some rumble about my ministry. But one of those one of those doctrines then at that point in time was the doctrine of kenosis, and that's related to this idea of the incarnation of Christ. So what I'm seeing today is after something like 50 years, a little more than 50 years of teaching categorized doctrine, now what happens is when you come back and you begin to exposit the Word of God, there's no way that that ex ex expos uh, expositing of doctrine will make any sense unless you understand the doctrines that are being alluded to in that passage of Scripture. So when it says here, but emptied himself, the emptying is the doctrine of kenosis. What I did then, it, as I taught that in the past, I thought, well, I'm not going to do that again. What I'm going to do is to, is to take that doctrine and I'm going to send it to you. So this past week, I sent you the doctrine of kenosis as a single, as a single doctrine, hoping that maybe you would take that and read that and study it. And if you have any, if you have any questions about it, certainly ask me and I'll try to clarify that. But the doctrine of kenosis is actually related to this word, but he emptied himself. Kenoo, there's where you get the idea of kenosis. And that, what does that mean? Kenoo, what that means is he voluntarily, it was a voluntary act of humiliation. Now stop and think about that. Jesus Christ as the perfect God, co-equal and co-eternal with the Father whose plan it is, and the Holy Spirit, who's the third person of the Trinity, he was co-equal with both of those. And God the Father said to him one, one time in eternity past, I have a plan and I want you to do this. I want you to become a human being. There is the incarnation. But to become, become a human being, something had to happen because no human being is exactly like Jesus Christ. He is God. And so to become a human being, there was something that something that had to happen there where he emptied himself voluntarily. God didn't have to get out the 
the panel. He didn't have to get out a whip. He didn't have to coerce him. He didn't have to badger him. He didn't have to pay him, pay him off. He didn't have to give him something. This was a voluntary act of humiliation. Now, when you begin to understand that, and you're facing life circumstances out here, and you know that God the Father is in control of every crisis, every good thing that ever happened in life, you know he's got it all in his own grip. And here you are, you're functioning down here, walking daily in this sewer, in this swamp of life. And then you find out that God has a plan for you in this swamp. He has a plan for you in this mess. And it isn't just sitting around and complaining about everything that's going on. God has a plan where, whereby we will have contact where we will be out in the public square. And that doesn't mean just going out, no, going out in the public square. What does that mean? That means just going about your daily life. And if you're not locked in, you know, you're not having to walk around in the house with a mask on and taking 15 kinds of shots and all that kind. Maybe you get out, you get out once in a while. You go out somewhere, you come in contact with people. The question is, when you get out there, what is what is your life like? And if people were to, to stop you and to talk with you, uh, they would see you. They would see you doing whatever. Would you give? Would you manifest any kind uh, of character of Christ in that situation or not? Well, understand this: when Christ became a human being, here he is. He has the total essence of God, and he had to empty himself of some of that. So we're going to find out what that emptying means. But when you find out that he emptied himself and you take a look at what that provided for you and me, because he voluntarily acted in such a way to humiliate himself by becoming a human being, now you begin to understand how important and how wonderful your salvation is, because without that humiliation taking place, there's nothing left for you and me except hellfire and the lake of fire and nothing but that in all of eternity future. So understanding the doctrine of kenosis and the very fact that Christ emptied himself, and how did he empty himself? Look at this. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant. Now look at that phrase by taking. That word taking there is a verb. And it is, it is, uh, it's, the, it's the word lambano, L-A-M-B-A-N-O, lambano. And grammatically, that means when you take a look at the grammar, the syntax, the etymology, when you take a look at the grammar of that verb um, lumbano, you understand that what he is saying there is he emptied himself having taken. In other words, something that's already, already done. There was a point in time in his pre-incarnate life where he was totally the essence of God. But there came a point in time and that is at the virgin birth, where he, he emptied himself. And how did he empty himself? By taking the form of a bondservant. So we see that he's taking the form of a bondservant, I mean, having taken, and that is viewing his incarnation. Now listen to this, when he said he emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant. So at his virgin birth, this is where the form of a bondservant came into existence. The only issue there then is when did it stop? Well, it didn't stop two days after he became a human being. It didn't, it didn't stop down here in uh, a couple of weeks uh, after, he was, uh, after he was born physically. But actually, this means that he, he actually took upon himself this form of a bond servant at the moment he became born physically and that, and that goes all the way down to the time of his resurrection. So in those years from, the birth, from his virgin birth to the time of his resurrection, he took on himself the form of a bond servant. Now, the word form here is the word morphe, M-O-R-P-H-E. And this means the inner essence. In other words, he took upon himself the inner essence, the inner being, whatever, whatever a bond servant is like, he took upon himself the inner essence of a bond slave, and this means the inner, and this inner essence refers to the humanity of Christ. So what did he do? He took upon himself the form of man. He became a human being. Now he's still God, but he's now he's now taking upon himself a form of a human being. And and in that form, what did he do? 
what was he doing? He became a bond servant. Now hold on just a moment. I want us to take a look at this, what this, what this bond servant thing is, because we're living in a day and age when you, uh, when you, you take a look at uh, life, you take a look at human history, you look at uh, all the way back from the time that Adam, Adam came out of the garden, and shortly into into human life outside of the outside of the garden, we've got fallen uh, fallen humanity. We've got fallen uh, creation, and uh, it's just it's not a, it's not like it was when he was back in the when he was back in the uh, the Garden of Eden. So now Jesus is coming into this mess down here. He takes upon himself the form of a bond servant. What does this bond servant mean? Well, actually, the word bond servant, that hyphenated word, two words there, it's actually one Greek word. And it's the word doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S. And that means servant. It means slave. And because of the issue of slavery in this country, slavery around the world, in fact, right now in China, we got uh, uh, people's heads being cut off because they don't fall into the uh, into the uh, the government's uh, plans for their life. The same thing is happening around the world where Christians are being persecuted because of whom, what they are. But in this plan of God, as it relates to the angelic conflict, see, Jesus didn't just come down here to become a human being. He didn't want to go to Starbucks and have a cup of coffee with you. He didn't want to go Panera Bread and get his phone out or his iPad out and watch TV or watch, uh, watch, watch some some program on his iPad. No, he came down here with a plan. And if he's going to follow that plan in those 33 years from the time he was born physically to the time he actually went to the cross, three days later came out of the cross, 40 days later was ascended into heaven and was seated at the right hand of God the Father. During that period of incarnation, he became a bond servant. He became a doulos. That means a servant. He became a slave. Now let's talk about that slavery for just a moment. Jesus Christ became a slave to his master. See, a slave has a master. A master, in this sense, has a slave, someone who's working for them, working with them. Jesus Christ became a slave to his master. His master is God the Father. God the Father sent him into the world with a plan for his life. And that plan for him, he had to go to the cross to die for the sins of the world. So people like you and me, looking back at your past, regardless of how bad it was, how good it was, you're, you have a trend toward asceticism, and you're just filled with all kinds of human good. You look at the other guy and you look at the rotten life they lived. Listen, Jesus Christ died for both of us. He died for the sins of the world. And in order to do that, Jesus Christ had to live 33 years without committing a sin. Otherwise, he would not have been able to pay for the sins of the world because he, could, he certainly couldn't have paid for his own because now God wanted a perfect sacrifice. And that's why the sacrifices in the Old Testament were animals without blemish. And they would take them to the altar and sacrifice him. Well, here we have the perfect Lamb of God going to go to the go, going to go to the cross to pay for your sins. Look at your life. Pay for your sins and mine for the sins of the entire world. And in order to do that, Jesus Christ became a slave to his master, God the Father, for that thirty-three years. And what I want us to understand is what that word "doulos" actually means. Now, if you, if you uh, are really a student of the Word of God, you want to know something more about uh, the Word of God, and you want to learn some things, I had a, bl a blessed brother uh, get in touch with me last night, and, and it was, it's wonderful. He wanted to know, he wants to know, uh, what, is, what, is, uh, what does the word if mean in this verse? What does the word if mean in that verse? What does the word if mean here? We know that there are four conditional uses. But if we're going to interpret the word of God correctly, we have to understand what that word if means. If it is true, if it's, if it is not true, uh, maybe it is, maybe it's not. I wish it were true, but it's not. There's four, four class conditions. So what in the world does it mean? In the past, one of the, one of the things that I've always wanted to do was to go through the New Testament from Matthew all the way to Revelation and take every word if and make a, make a booklet out of that 
and uh, take that word if and tell in this in this verse of scripture, this is what that word if means. It means it's a first class, second class, third class. Well, well, I've never been able to have the time to get to that, but that's something I've always wanted to do. Now, I was asked uh, in uh, a couple of years ago, I was asked to teach a Bible class at the senior center here in Maumelle, but they wanted they wanted you to teach a class that wouldn't, you know, upset uh, the Methodists, the Episcopalians, the Lutherans, the Catholics, the, or the Jewish people, or whatever. They oh, you teach the Bible, but you know, don't don't make don't create any problems in a Bible class. Well, I understood that, but I thought there was something that I could teach and and help people, and I taught the meaning of the word if in several passages of scripture. That's one of the things I did. Now, as a result of that, this was supposed to last for a, 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 like a quarter. But after I finished that, they liked it so well, they asked me to come back and do it for another quarter. Then they asked me to come back again, but I didn't have the time to do that. But it started with that word if, okay? Now look here. If you're going to understand what the word if means, if you're gonna understand what any word in the Bible means, there is a Bible program out there that's called Bible Hub, B-I-B-L-E-H-U-B. And when you go out to, to that program that has several different facets of uh, study for you, but one of the things does, it gives you the Hebrew, it gives you the Greek and the New Testament, the Hebrew and the Old Testament, and it actually parses every word for you. And it gives you a, it gives you a definition for all that, uh, the, the way the word is used in the Bible the way it's used in this verse, the way it's used someplace else. Well, let's take a look at this word doulos. And what I've done is I just extracted from Bible Hub, Hub in order to show you how this, how this works. And here's what it says about doulos. And here I am right here in my notes, right, right there on that line, okay? Here's what it says about doulos. This word is translated bond slave, okay? And so, you know, you get that idea of bond slave. I don't like this idea about slavery, okay? Hold on just a moment. Doulos. In Bible Hub, perfect, perfect example. It, you can believe what it's saying. It says properly, the word doulos means someone who belongs to another. That's not just walking alongside them. This, you own him. You own her. You own it. So here properly, the word doulos means someone who belongs to another. Well, just a moment. Look what it says. Jesus emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a bond servant. He became a human being. But as a result of being a human being, he was here, he was here with a purpose. He was here for a purpose. And the purpose was to go to the cross, die for the sins of the world, and be resurrected and go to seed be seated right hand to God the Father, and then at a certain point in time, come back down in the air, take the body of Christ out of here, take us back to heaven, give us a judgment at the bema seat of Christ, while the while the great tribulation is going on down here in, on planet Earth, the tribulation seven-year period, the great tribulation, the last three and a half years of that seven-year period, and while we're being evaluated at the bema seat, all this hell is broken loose down here on planet Earth, for seven years, looking forward to the time of the second coming of Christ, when you and I will come back down from heaven as born-again Christians in a resurrection body to reign with Christ throughout 1,000 years of a millennial period. But to, in order to be able to do that, Jesus, in the 33 years while he was walking on planet Earth, while he was here, had to take the form of a bond servant. And what does that mean? The word doulos means someone who belongs to another. Well, who is the someone? The someone is Jesus. To whom does he belong? He belongs to the Father. The fa God the Father is, is his master. God the Father had a plan. He has a plan for the human race. He had a plan for Christ. He wants us to carry out his plan. He wanted Jesus to carry out that plan. And as doing so, Jesus then was a bond servant. He came, became a human being. He belonged to God the Father. And that word do lost goes on and says, without ownership of rights of their own. Do you hear that? That means that when you come, when you as a born again Christian, just like Jesus, you and I become a do loss. We become a we become a slave, a bond slave to God the Father. 
He has a plan for every born again Christian. We're living the Christian way of life in the angelic conflict. We're not just sitting around drinking coffee. We're not just sitting around doing whatever, uh, watching TV, going to ball games, or whatever else you're going on, going to work. You know, listen, God has a plan for your life. And that plan is for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 30 days or 31 or 28 or 27 days a month until you die physically. God has a plan for your life. And guess what? We are a doulos. We are a bond slave, just like Jesus. We don't, we don't own any rights of our own. We own only the rights that God gives us. And, they, and by the way, he does give us rights. He gives human beings rights. And guess what? That's what the government today is doing, taking them away. In Canada, in the United States, in China, in Russia, in Iran, in Iraq, just name it, wherever. See, the world's a mess, but you have certain rights and you, you, you don't own any rights of your own. You own the rights that God has given you. Now, ironically, this word doulos, here's what it says. Ironically, 1401, that's the number of this word in, the, in what is called, uh, I've got it written down here, it's the helps. Uh, let's see, <clears throat> on down here, uh, I've written that, oh yes, it's right above there. It says, uh, when you're looking at this word uh, doulos, here it says, more information from helps word studies. That's what it's called in Bible Hub, and that's where I copy this to help you to see the meaning of this word doulos. Well, ironically, doulos, meaning bond slave, now listen, when you think about a slave today, and especially a slave who is actually being badgered, being intimidated, being persecuted, being painfully beaten, what hung from a tree somewhere. When you, whatever idea you have of a slave and the ma the slave master, and the slave master is generally a a scumbag of some sort. You think because of what he's doing to his slaves. Excuse me. When you see this word "doulos" in the Bible, that word "doulos," meaning bond servant, is used in the highest dignity in the New Testament. So, because you are are a, a bond slave to to Jesus Christ carrying out God the Father's plan. This is not intended to say, oh my goodness, you're a slave. Oh, I'm so sorry for you. No, it is used with the highest dignity. So when you become a slave to God the Father, when you become a slave to Jesus Christ, this is used with the highest dignity in the New Testament, namely of believers. Now watch this. It is used of believers who willingly live under Christ's authority as his devoted follower. This is the problem in our country today. This is a problem in Christianity. We've got these people out here that I indicated to you that David Barton says the, 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 in, in his survey, the, the biggest problem that people are talking about in their Christian way of life is fear, fear, Fear. I fear, fear the vaccine. I fear the mask. I fear the government. I fear Biden. I fear Trump. I fear this. I fear that. Wait a minute. I fear that I won't have money. I fear that I'm going to lose my home. Oh, my, my, my money's short and I can't buy gas. Who knows? Uh, maybe we're going to run out of food. Excuse me. Who in the world is in charge? Yeah, God's in charge. Yes, he is. So what happens is, that, look, I, I, I love this. The bond slave is used in the, with the highest dignity in the New Testament, namely, namely of believers who are willing to live under Christ's authority as his devoted followers. And as I indicated, this is not what's happening, generally speaking, in Christianity today. We have people who are going to church, singing the choir, doing all these kind of things, but there is no willingness to live under Christ's authority. How do you live under Christ's authority? You take the word of God, you take every command in the word of God, and you are obedient to that command. And what you're doing then is you're following Christ's authority. You are one of his devoted followers. So when you look at that one more time, a doulos used with the highest dignity in the New Testament is used of you if you are willing to live under Christ's authority and doing that. Christ said, listen, if you tell me you love me, then do this. 
keep my commandments. So if we're not keeping the commandments of the word, uh, commandments in the word of God for we as born again Christians, living in the age of grace, if we're not doing that, then we are unwillingly living under Christ's authority, then we are not a doulos. So a doulos is someone, a born-again Christian, who is willingly living under Christ's authority. And what that means is, even as a babe in Christ, as an adolescent in Christ, as someone who has only reached spiritual self-esteem, wanting to move on to spiritual autonomy, this means the, the person, no matter where you are, your vision is your vision, that is your mental vision, is to reach the goal, to, to, to cross the finish line. And that is becoming a maximally mature believer functioning in the angelic, angelic conflict as a doulos, as a slave to Jesus Christ. So it's telling us here that Christ then is this bondservant, says, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. Now, that word born there, being born, is the word ginomai, and it, really, it's, it doesn't mean born. It's used that way. It can be used that way. But actually, the word ginomai properly means to emerge, to become. It means transitioning. Well, now, let's go back to verse 6. In verse 6, we're seeing what Christ was like in his pre-incarnate pre life. In verse 7, we're taking a look at his post uh, actually, at when he became a human being. That was his incarnation. So verse 6 takes you back before he became a human. Verse 7 takes a look at him after he became a human being. And that phrase, and being born, notes that transition from his, from his deity to his hypostatic union as a human being and God wrapped up in one person forever. So that word genomai then, it's translated being born, and that, that's okay, but it means to, to emerge. It's more than just being born. See, I was born, but I didn't emerge. You were born, but you didn't emerge. You were, uh, somebody else was born, but they, they didn't emerge. Emerge, what do you mean? Well, Jesus was one thing in his pre-incarnate life, he is something else in his incarnate life, and we have to understand that. That's why I ask the question, can you, can you actually uh, discuss, can you tell somebody about the nature of Christ before he was born? Can you talk about the, the essence of, of uh, Jesus after he is born? What's it like? So that word genomai, being born, actually means to emerge, to become, to transition from one point to another, from, from one realm to another, from one condition to another. And an example of that transition is this. Jesus, in his undiminished deity, before he was born physically, to his hypostatic union, coming into being, being born physically. So we're looking at that. See, that's why we said that the very first word in verse 7 is but. It's a conjunction of contrast, contrasting his pre-incarnate uh, pre uh, pre life with his incarnate life, okay? So it says what he was, he was being born, born how? He said he was born in the likeness, in the likeness, and that word likeness is amoi oma, amoi ona, oma. And that means outer likeness. So after being born in the outer likeness, not inner likeness, not the inner likeness, but he was born in the likeness of men. We said, wait a minute. No, if he's a human being, he was born just like you and I. He must be just like you and I. No, no, no. Hold on now. He was born in the likeness, the outer likeness of man, but he was not born in with the inner likeness of man. What does that mean? And the word men there is the word anthropos, which means mankind. So what he was doing, now here's an interpretive translation of that verse. After discussing it, it says, but he deprived himself of the proper function of deity when he had received the form of a servant, although he had been born in the likeness of mankind. Outer likeness now, not inner likeness. Let's stop here now. Stop and think about all of what, what this means. What does all of this mean? Well, I've got several points, and I've got some diagrams that will go with it. Now, let me do this. Let me raise my my uh, my split screen here. Give us some more room. 
Now let's take a look at this. Outwardly, now see, we said that it was the outer likeness of man, not the inner likeness. So outwardly, Christ's humanity, that's when he, be, that when he was born physically, Christ's humanity had the same appearance of every other human being on the outside. So when you see him walking down the street, if you didn't know who he was, and you saw him walking down the street, you probably wouldn't even think, well, that just that's another human being. It's not a dog. It's not a mule. It's not a cow. It's not an airplane. It's not something else. It's a human being. So outwardly, Christ's humanity had the same appearance of every human being. Okay, he had, had hands, he had feet, he had a tongue, he had eyes and ears and a nose. That's the outer appearance. So he looked just like every other human being on the outside. He looked like a human being. However, on the inside, and this is why when he became a human being, he took, he took upon himself the form of flesh, but it's the, the form of the likeness of men, but it was the outer, outer um, likeness, not the inner likeness. He looked like a human being, but on the inside, he was different in that he was not born with what? He was not born with an old sin nature. He never created an old sin nature. That's the first, that's first sentence here now. Take a look at it. He was, he was born in the likeness of man on the outside, but he was not like man on the inside because when you are born physically, you have an old sin nature in every cell of your body. But he, he didn't have an old sin nature. God did, not, God did not give him. He did not impute an old sin nature to Jesus Christ when he was actually at the moment of conception. He didn't receive that old sin nature, and he never sinned one time in his life. So after 33 years, when he's getting ready to go to the cross, guess what? He still didn't have an old sin nature. He was like man on the outside, but he was not like man on the inside. Jesus Christ never sinned one time. So let's go back up here and take a look at our take a look at our diagram. On the right hand side here, I have a picture of supposedly a picture of Jesus. But when you look at it, when you look at him, if I put somebody else beside him, you say, "Well, that's just that's another human being." Hey, yeah, they look alike. They 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 don't they they're not the same. Uh, he, one has a beard, the other one doesn't. Uh, the other one has long fingernails, the other one doesn't. Um, one, one has gray hair, the other one has brown hair. No, on the outside, they look alike. That's the humanity of Christ. But what he, was, what he didn't have was an old sin nature. On the inside, he was not the same of man. And what I have here is a diagram. I've, it's the diamond shape that I've used and we've used for years to, uh, to represent the old sin nature. So that, that diamond there is representing the old sin nature. He didn't have one of these. And because he didn't have one of these, I, what I've done here is I've actually numbered, numbered the, the old sin nature in this manner. Number one, number two, number three, and number four. And we'll see what those are in just a moment. But each one of those are a, fa are a uh, there, there's a, there are characteristics of that old sin nature that you and I have that he didn't have. He was not born with one. He doesn't have our inner likeness. We have the old sin nature. He didn't. And because we have the old sin nature, one, two, three, and four, those numbers around that, uh, that um, diagram is indicative, indicative of the fact that we need to understand what all those things are. He didn't have one. You and I do. Now let's move on down down to our point here. We're going to talk about those um, those numbers in just a moment. Look at the diagram on the right hand side. Up above, we just saw Jesus as a human being. We saw an old sin nature separate and apart from that. You and I have one inside of inside of us, every cell of our body, tainted with the old sin nature. But he didn't have one. Well, what does the number one, two, three, and four stand for? Well, when you go back and look, if you want to study this on your own later, go back and look at that diamond and look up at the top for the number one. That number one there represents the area of weakness of the old sin nature. And if you have an area of weakness, what, what happens from that area of weakness? Well, what happens is this is, where you, this is where you sin. You sin from this area of your old sin nature. Now, listen, it's an old sin nature. This is just an illustration to help you to understand what this old sin nature is inside of you. 
So we say, let's, let's mark the top of this. Number one, it's an area of weakness. That's the air. That's the, the area from which you're going to commit personal sins. What kind of sins can you commit? Well, you can commit mental sins, verbal sins, and overt sins. What are they? A mental sin is what you think. Now, here's the interesting thing. You can be sinning, and I don't know it. Because if it's a mental sin, it's something that's going on inside your head. You hate me. You just, you, uh, you're, you're, you're wanting to uh, just slap the stew out of somebody. Well, that's a, mental, that's a mental thing, okay? It's your attitude. So you have this mental attitude sin. Anger, jealousy, vindictiveness. See, these are things that go on inside your head. Anybody else may not know that. They may not see that in you. But God knows it. And when you have that mental sin, you are out of fellowship with God. You're not at that point in time a doulos because you're not willingly living according to God's plan in the angelic conflict, which means there will be consequences for that at the beam of seed judgment. See, this is not some game we're playing. This is life. It's the spiritual life, not just physical life. This is physical life attached, or better still, spiritual life attached to the physical life. Because we're born again Christian, God has a plan for us. So you can sin mentally. That's thinking sin, the verbal sin. Well, first of all, you think it and then you speak it. That's a verbal sin, okay? The overt sin, you think it and then you go out and do it. An overt set sin is something, it's an act of sin that you're actually doing outwardly where someone can see what's going on. Then number two are the trends. And in your life, because you have an old sin nature, Jesus didn't have these trends. He didn't have an old sin nature. So each one of us have a trend toward asceticism or lasciviousness. Now, what we've done is we've we've de defined that. So if you're, you're if you're um, uh, new to us and you don't know this idea of asceticism and lasciviousness, what you need to understand is you have an old sin nature in every cell of your body, and you have a you have a trend in one direction or another. Now, a trend means on a scale of one to ten, you are either a you are either a uh, you're either a five point one of of one and four point nine of the other. You may be you may be a six and four. You may be a seven and three. You may be an uh, an eight and two. You may be a nine nine a nine or a one. And what that means is you have a you have a trend nine nine toward asceticism, one toward lasciviousness, or maybe eight toward lasciviousness and two toward asceticism. Well, uh, so when you ask somebody what is your trend, they'll stop and think, and when they haven't been taught how to to look at this. They say, hmm, well, I guess I am, uh, I don't know what I am. And you take a look at them and say, well, listen, I, you've demonstrated all your life what you are. You are lascivious. Well, an ascetic is a person who is naturally good, Natu naturally good, doing good things. Oh, they don't, they don't, they don't do anything evil. They don't lie, they don't cheat, they don't steal, they don't cuss. Uh, they don't hate anybody. Oh, they help the old lady across the street three times. They give her coat away to the to the to the, the freezing homeless person on the street. Uh, you stop and you give them a five dollar bill. You give them an umbrella, whatever. Okay, that's good. But, but the point is this: that many people will will say, "Wait a minute, no, I no, I do a little of both." Well, yes, you do a little of both, but one is dominant, and that's why you say you have a trend. We say you have a trend. You either have a trend toward lasciviousness, that's a hell raiser, or you have a trend toward asceticism, that's a bleeding heart do-gooder. But you have a trend toward one or the other, and you can do both. Okay? So there's there's the trends of your life. Then in the area of then the area of strength, number three at the bottom, is where you do your human good. You're doing good. But this is the good that's going to burn up at the bema seat because you're not living the Christian way of life according to the plan of God, doing the right thing in the right way. So whatever you do that's good in the sphere of the flesh is human good. When you do good in the sphere, in the sphere of the spirit, that's divine good. Divine good is rewardable and blessed. Human good just burns up at the bema seat and is worthless to God and to you while you're alive. 
That's why the plan of God must be carried out as a protocol plan, a precisely correct procedure. Then there's the lust patterns. <laughs> First one, power lust. Well, just take a look at Washington, D.C. Take a look at China. Take a look at Russia. Take a look at something else out here. Uh, your boss, your, your, your co-workers, power lust. There's pleasure lust. That's approbation lust. Oh, I'm sorry, pleasure lust. That's, that's where you're, all you want, you're seeking pleasure everywhere you go. Forget God. Who cares about him? What I want is I want pleasure. Then there's sexual lust. There's social lust. There's approbation lust. That's l lust for approval. Okay? Uh, monetary lust. Chemical lust, crusader lust, revenge lust, criminal lust. This is the old sin nature. Now, go back over here and look at point two. Point number one said, outwardly, Christ's humanity had the same appearance of every human being. On the outside, he looked like a human being, but on the inside, he was different in that he was not born with an old sin nature, and he didn't commit one sin in his entire human life, okay? Now, in verse six, we said, we were, remember, we were doing a contrast. And what was the contrast? In verse 6, the contrast was his, between his pre-incarnate life and his incarnate life in verse 7. So in verse 6, Jesus has the essence of deity, and he will always have the essence of deity. There's never been a time in, in his entire life, and of course, he's eternal. He's never had a beginning but he's, he has always had the essence of deity. Now, what is the essence of deity? So when I ask you, can you explain the character of Christ in his pre-incarnate pre life? Can you tell us what, God, what Christ was like before he was born physically? Sure, you can tell me. He was invisible spirit, and he had, he, he had certain characteristics. And what is the essence of deity? The essence of deity or the, ser the, the characteristics of deity are cell junior uive. You know what that means? Sovereignty, eternal life, love, justice, absolute righteousness, omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, immutability, and veracity. Now, what happens is you know those words. You've memorized this. Do you know what each one of them mean? Well, you need to know what they mean because that's the essence of deity. You and I don't have that. We don't have those. But he had those permanently. Okay, now watch. So that point two, in verse six, he has the essence of deity. There is the essence, okay? In verse seven, it says, in verse seven, Jesus took upon himself the essence of humanity, with the exception that he did not receive the imputation, which means God simply credited to his account, the old sin nature, because no human man, no human being, no human man impregnated the Virgin Mary. Now, remember, Note this, if you didn't already know it, the old sin nature, the old sin nature, your old sin nature was passed on to you and is passed on to the human race through the sperm of a male. So when, you're, when your mother and your father had a sexual encounter and his sperm entered her body and made contact with a female ovum, when those two things joined together, that sperm had an old sin nature in it, and in the impregna impregnation of that, that uh, female ovum, it now has a, an old sin nature, and as you, your body develops, every cell of your body has an old sin nature in it. Jesus did not have a human father, therefore he did not have an old sin nature. No human, no human man impregnated the Virgin Mary. It was the Holy Spirit. So he was born perfectly without an old sin nature. Point number four. Let's talk about Jesus was pure deity and pure humanity wrapped up in one person forever. So we got this, this joining, this transition, this, uh, the, the conjunction of contrast, but is taking a look at him before he was born physically after he was born physically, and he still is pure deity, and he is pure humanity, wrapped up in one person forever, and made, and this made him uniquely, the uniquely born person of the universe. Jesus Christ is the uniquely born person of the universe. No one is like him. Jesus Christ, born with 100% deity, 100% humanity, 
and that humanity and deity are wrapped up in one person called a hypostatic union. These two, these two uh, characteristics, characters are, are joined together to wrap up into one person. Now, notice in point four, let's go over here to the diagram on verse on point four. Now, while, while on the left-hand side of this little diagram, point four, Jesus Christ and hypostatic union, before he was born physically, all he had was the left side. Well, that's enough. That, that's better than anything else. There's nothing else like that. That was his, that was his deity. On the right-hand side, when he became a man, notice the 100% humani humanity, but he didn't have an old sin nature. And the humanity is characterized by three parts. He had a human body, he had a soul, and he had a human spirit. And his soul had characteristics, five of them. His soul had self-consciousness, which made him aware of himself. I think, therefore, I am. I'm a human being. I know that. So he was aware of, he was aware of himself. You are aware of yourself. You have a soul. He had volition, which enabled him to choose for or against things, for the plan of God, against the plan of God. He had a mentality where, as a human being, he was, listen, when he was born physically, he had zero information in his soul, zero information in his mentality. He had to learn just like you and I have to learn. And as he learned and lived out his, lived out his Jewish life, he was learning the plan of God in his humanity. He was doing what God wanted him to in his humanity. He was following Jewish custom. But he also had, he also had emotion. He had he was able to feel. This is the this is where the the appreciator of the soul. He also had a conscience, norms and standards in his in his humanity, and he also had a human spirit, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and he was guided by the Spirit in his in his physical life. Now, what happened is when he became a human being. Now, what we have is a union between his humanity and his deity, or better still, his deity and his humanity. Let's put his deity first. Not essential, but we're going to do it that way. So he had 100% deity. He had 100% humanity. And when you move on to point number five, stop and think about this. Jesus Christ, point number five, Jesus Christ himself from his own deity. If his own, now, that's the left-hand side of the equation over here. From his own deity and from the volition of his deity. And see, I don't have I don't have volition in that left hand column, but that's what sovereignty is. Sovereignty is the capacity to choose, and it's the super super choice, the super chooser. Okay, that's his sovereignty. So Jesus had Jesus had volition just like you and I do, but it's called sovereignty. He had the capacity to make decisions to become true humanity. And that's what he did. In order to become true humanity back in eternity past, when the Father wanted him and says, look, I got this plan. I want you to become a human being. And Jesus said, okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. See, he made a choice. And he chose with his sovereignty. And that's why in point five over here, we look at the volition of Christ, and we have his, we have his total essence, cell junior uai. He had all of those. That was, that was the essence of God, essence of deity. But notice what I did. I took the S there, I emboldened it, and I blew it up to focus on his sovereignty. That's Christ's capacity to choose. So in eternity past, when the Father asked him to become a human being and take upon himself this form of humiliation, he said, yes, I will do it. And it was sovereignty that made that decision. Now we've got a couple minutes left. Now stop and think about this. Stop and think about this with me. What are we going to think about? The greatness of Christ's decision in eternity past. Here they are. Just picture this. It's an illustration, please. They're sitting around and talking. And the father says to the son, you know, son, I've been thinking about something. He said, I want you to go down and become, I want you to be born of a human, born of a virgin. I want you to become a human being. And I, you see all that sin down there? You see all those people sinning? Oh, my goodness. Look at the Jews. Look what they're doing. Look what those Gentiles are doing down there. Boy, it's a mess, isn't it? Satan's down there just messing up their lives. But you know what? I love them. Son, I love them. 
I want you to go down there and become a human being and pay for the sins of the world. Jesus is sitting back there at the table talking to Jesus, talking to the Father. Again, an illustration, please. Mental vision, men, mental vision of this thing. What we see then is when Jesus said, I'll do it, the greatness of Christ's decision in eternity past to become true humanity can never be overemphasized. You can't overemphasize. You can't talk enough about it. You can't blow it up to where it's just blown out of out of proportion. The greatness of Christ's decision in eternity past to become true humanity can never be overemphasized for three reasons. If he hadn't made that decision, there would be no salvation for you and me. Our very existence is because he was born physically, and our eternal future. All of these three things are based upon Christ's decision in eternity past to become true humanity. Now, there, are two, there were two great decisions related to our salvation. So he makes this decision so that we can be saved, and there are two great decisions related to our salvation. One was the decision to deprive himself of the proper function of deity. So when he becomes a, becomes a human being, he not only is a human being, he is 100% deity, but in his humanity, he had to deprive himself of the function of every aspect of his deity. And the second decision of his true humanity was his true humanity to do the will of God the Father. We'll see that this coming Wednesday as we pick up and finish this before we go on to, uh, to uh, the next verse. What we want to do is look at the decision of his true humanity to do the will of the Father mentioned in Matthew, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So two great decisions related to our salvation, yours and mine. The decision to deprive himself of the proper function of deity. Look at the diagram. I have on the left-hand side 100% deity, but what happens when he became a human being? He decided that he would not use any of that. His sovereignty, eternal life, love, just none of that would be used to carry him in a daily function of his life as he became that bond servant of Jesus Christ. When he found himself in a difficult situation, he didn't haul off and go over to his omnipresence, his omniscience, his om, him nom, uh, om, omnipotence. He didn't pull out his omnipotence and say, whammo, I don't like that, get out of my way. No, he didn't do that. He functioned as a human being the whole way. So we'll pick up right here next this Wednesday and move on from here. Thank you folks for being with me this morning to learn something about what our Christian way of life is really all about. What we're seeing is the picture beginning to, to blossom and to see what Christianity really is. Father, thank you this morning for your uh, for the privilege of teaching this passage of scripture. Goodness gracious, wonderful Father, the joy within me, the joy within us, knowing who you are, what your plan is, the fact that you've given us the capacity to work that plan and to have happiness, joy, able to rejoice when all things are falling apart. Oh, listen, Father, it's getting that way. And oh, we have people screaming for Jesus to come back, get him out of here. No, not until you're ready, Father. That's what we need to see. You have, you're leaving us here for a particular reason. And that is to manifest your light wherever we happen to go with other people more important than we are. Taking to ourselves and saying, look, this I, I need to, I need to humble myself in my Christian way of life that I might be all that you ever expected me to be or us to be. In Christ's name, amen. Listen, God bless all of you. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, let me let me just do one thing before I close out our uh, close out our time. I'm going to look down here and see uh, if there's anybody down here be, be below Richard. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank every one of you for being online with me. And those of you, of you on Facebook, God bless you. Good day and see you Wednesday. Bye-bye.